One day you'll make sense of it all Jesus One day every question resolved Every anxious thought left behind No more fear When we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be When we all see Shout the victory One day we will see face to face Jesus Is there a greater vision of grace In a moment we shall be changed On that day Are we good? Getting ready for winter to come as the brisk air starts piling in? Ooh, bless you. There we go. That was the answer right there. <laughs> Let me pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for the morning and the opportunity to just be in your presence and to be together and to have something peculiar and wonderful happen. So Lord, move in and among us today. Move through us. Speak to us that we would hear the words of your heart, your spirit, and that they would engage with our heart, our spirit and that we would reflect you in all we do and all we say. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. With this heart open wide from the depths the heights 
Be thou my vision, 
Thy presence
Father, as, um, as we meet you this morning, may our thoughts and our words um, and the, the very imaginings you give us, Lord, reflect you and, and uh, indelibly mark who we are today. And may you be our God and may we revel in the wonderful truth of being your children. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Do me a favor, shake a hand, learn a name, say hello. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to say that there is no children's church today, so they will be sitting with us in the service, and we're all together. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning here at Mosaic. My name is Heather. It is great to have you. If you are a guest with us, there's a white pamphlet in the back of your pew titled Things You Might Want to Know. Take a look at it. There's also a gray connection card, and that's your tool to communicate with us. So if you have any questions on uh, serving or events that are coming up, fill it out on that connection card, and we'll get you in contact with the right person. Um, once you fill it out, just drop it into any one of our giving boxes. They're located out here in the narthex and out each one of these doorways into the main hall. So you can find it there and drop it in. Uh, this week, uh, Wednesday, is November 1st, and the first Wednesday of every month is our prayer night. Uh, so we would just love uh, for you to join us uh, for worship and prayer together uh, as one, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, join us and bring a friend if you would like. Also, we need help restocking the pantry, so one item makes a big difference. Uh, so if you're out and about at the grocery store this week or you have a couple on hand, uh, go ahead and uh, bring it in. There's a grocery cart downstairs that you can put it in or uh, drop it off in the office during our office hours. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, and then I just wanted to mention next Sunday after second service, there is a young adult lunch. Uh, it'll be downstairs in the hub at approximately 1230. Uh, so that would be great. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we have uh, some ladies that uh, really want to aid and uh, help the hurricane victims. They just have a heart for that. So they have made some uh, beautiful jewelry. And if you want to go downstairs, uh, you can make a donation if you have a heart for that as well. And uh, they ha have bracelets and jewelry for you to choose to take home with you and a uh, reminder to pray for the victims. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, madam. Mm -hmm. How was everybody this morning? Good. All right, fair warning, not an easy morning. Not going to be an easy one. So this is what I want to do to set the tone. I need us to turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. You're going to need your notes and a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, grab one from the pew in front of you. If you don't own one, keep that one. If another one would better suit your needs, please let us know. We'll try to accommodate you. Um, the reason we're going to go to Mark 9 is I want to I, I set the right tone for where we're heading this morning. Now, I'm going to set this up. We're going to look at this story. Um, Jesus is having to deal with his disciples, and it's, it's on the heels of something magnificent, frankly. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus picks three of his disciples, and he takes them up to a mountain. And when they get up to that mountain, this is generally where Jesus would go to have his quiet time with his father and to pray. He takes these three up, James, Peter, and John, and they go up the mountain, and God shows up, Elijah and Moses shows up, and they have this incredible time. They are so moved that they're bewildered, and they're walking down the mountain. They, they, after that time is done, they're walking down the mountain, and they're talking about what it is they experienced. At the same time, Jesus had left the other nine down on the plain. So we're gonna, I'm going to set that up right there. 
And it, down on the plane, what's happening is the other nine have been confronted by an individual who brings his boy who's demon-possessed, and a, an argument ensues between, the, the, between the, the, those nine disciples and some Pharisees. This, that's where we are. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go forward. Father, we thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy. I pray, Jesus, that our hearts would be open to what you have for us this morning. Temper us right now and tenderize our hearts and help us to see your incredible love for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So here we are, we're in chapter nine, we're in verse 33. It says, now they came to Capernaum. They came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he's talking about Jesus, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? What were you arguing about on the road? Now, what we need to recognize is this. Jesus has come down the mountain with the three. They've just come from this incredible time of ministry with God the Father, Moses, and Elijah. The other nine are arguing with the Pharisees, and Jesus has come down to find them there. It's, what we're going to do is we're going to look very quickly at what it is they were arguing about and how it is they responded to it. So let's take a look at it. So one more time, it says, they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, when they had entered into a house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? Look, look what it says. But they kept what? They kept quiet. Why? Well, you're going to see here in a moment. They kept quiet because on the way they had argued who was the greatest. Now, who were they walking with? They were walking with the person of Jesus. Now, if we're, if we're not familiar with Jesus and how he functioned with his disciples in life, as he demonstrated continually the, the heart of a servant. He demonstrated continually the heart of humility and submission. And, so, and what he taught his disciples over and over and over again was the idea that leadership ha doesn't have to do with exerting authority. Leadership has to do with a posture of service. And so now the disciples are arguing. Now, I want us to make, why would we argue? Why would we argue about this particular thing? What would cause them to argue? Well, let us take something into account for a moment. Let's take a look at it again. It says, they came to Capernaum. When he went into his house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Jesus then sits down and he called the 12 to himself. If anyone wants to be first, he says, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Then he took a child, and he had him, the child stand among them, and taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little ones in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. What could they possibly have been arguing about? Well, let's think about this. He draws 12 men to himself, and he's discipling all 12. Every one of them had different gifts and different strengths and different leadership skills. They were all being developed to be, to be the heirs apparent to this to this king, messiah, this, this disciple maker. And every one of them brought a different angle in terms of how they perceived truth and perceived their role. And everyone, every one of them thought they were what? That they were right. Now this is really important for us. What might have exacerbated the argument? Well, let's, you're hanging out with 12 buddies and the leader of your gang takes three of you up to a special place. Wouldn't that a little, instill a little bit of confidence in you? Maybe a little bit of, hey, he thinks I'm special. Hey, I just got to hear God's voice. We heard Moses and Elijah, two of the greatest. Yeah, we got extra training with the man. That would cause me, I think, to probably think maybe I'm, you know, one of his favorites, one of the heirs apparent. But what about the other nine? Don't think that they didn't think of something of themselves also. Jesus took the other three because they couldn't trust him. So he made sure that they weren't messing around doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Now, this is not Jesus speaking, of course. It's the nine. Well, you know, he had to take them because they're a problem. He left us to deal with the crowd and to deal with the Pharisees. We know how Jesus did what he did, and we know what he said, what he said, and we could argue with anybody, and we are going to... Listen, all 12 had a reason to think that with how they were left or how they had gone with Jesus, that they had been given positions of authority, that they were given opportunities to exercise their authority, that they were going to jockey for the position of leader. And they all argued about it. They all had a reason to be proud of who they were. Jesus does something very interesting. So that he sits them down and he says, listen, you want to be a leader in my economy? Then you have to be the servant of all. And he calls a child to himself. And he says, let me tell you about the posture of the kingdom. And he takes a child in his arms. He says, listen, if you want to enter the kingdom, here's the posture. This is the posture, the posture of a servant, the posture of a child, the posture, listen, the posture of the lowly. 
What we need to do is recognize the posture that Jesus calls us to in regard to the kingdom and how we go about our business. That we are to go about it as lowly. We are to go about it as a servant. Turn to Mark 10 now for a moment. We're going to be around verse 41. What are, um, I think 41, one, one second, let me look again. Yeah, 41. So here's the thing I want us to recognize. As we go further, as we take into consideration what it is that God is doing in us and doing through us, what, what I want us to see is the attitude with which we go about it. Every one of us, every one of us has an eye to lead, an eye for authority, an eye to exert our influence. Every one of us. The question is, how do we go about it? With what attitude, with what heart, with what posture? So he goes in verse 41. Now it says that James and John and their mom came to Jesus and said, when you get to the kingdom, we want to be on your right hand and your left hand. We want the places of authority. And they did this in secret. So when we get to verse 41, it says, when the 10, the other 10, heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles do what? They lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Verse 43, what's it say? Not so with you. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for the ransom of many. This is the posture of the kingdom of heaven. We need to recognize, regardless of what it is we're called to, what spirit it is we find ourselves, what people we're called to influence, that the posture we take is a posture of a knee to the ground, a towel around our waist and a basin. That's the posture. And we think of that in terms of actual physical service, but I want us to understand something. Every interaction we have, we have the opportunity to take the posture of servant. Every conversation we have, we have the opportunity to take the position of the child. Every opportunity we have we, we, for, to converse or to be with, we have the opportunity to serve. And we serve as much with our words and our attitude and our tone as we do with our skills and our resources and our abilities. And this is essential for us to understand. There isn't anything, any resource that God hasn't placed in our hands that he doesn't not only hold us responsible for, but he, he holds us responsible for the manner in which we go about it. We're going to look at one specifically today. And, it, you know, we'll, see, we'll just see where it lands. So you're going to need your notes, and we're going to come out of the notes primarily today. If you don't have them, uh, we'll get them. But, and if you can get, find the electronic copy, you'll have all of my teaching notes. Because I will tell you right now, we're not getting through everything. And that's okay. There's enough scripture in here for you to take home to be able to dig deep into this for a week or even two weeks. And to be able to work through some of the things we're talking about today. Um, which I, I would encourage us all to be doing. So here we go. You ready? So you've got your notes. We're on the front page of the notes. So it says this. It says... We're called to speak the truth in love. Living a life, living a life that is worthy of the call that we have received is being, doing, and speaking as what we are, children of God, that we might bring glory to the one who saves us. Speaking the truth in love, this is right out of Ephesians 4. We're not going to read there. We've been in there for a while. So if, if you want to go home and look at the reference, take a look at Ephesians chapter 4. Speaking the truth in love necessitates, first and foremost, love. All right, let me be the master of the obvious for a minute, okay? We see the phrase, it says, speaking the truth in love. And you know how we see it? We see that as a phrase. What we don't very often do is take that phrase apart to see what it actually means. So speaking the truth means that we are, we are in conversation with somebody or in relationship with somebody as to be able to say to them or bring to them truth. So it says to speak the truth. Then it says to do this with the truth. All right? And we've talked about the truth as being who we are, who Christ Jesus is to the Father. There, there is a God. His Son is Jesus. He, is, he sent him on our behalf. And in doing so, we have this relationship. And that is the truth. But we speak that truth. And then what does it say? It says, in love. What does that mean? It necessitates that we love. Don't assume too quickly. What do we have to love? There's a whole lineage 
A whole, a whole line of things we need to love. First and foremost, we need to love God. And I don't assume that we all love God. Frankly, I can't assume that I love God all the time. And so the idea now is for me to have fostered a relationship with my father that continues the building of this love. So the first thing I need to do is love God. But not only God, look what it says now. It says, to be able to speak the truth in love, one must love God, who is the truth and the giver of truth. And so it's not enough for me to just love the recipient or the truth itself. It's for me to love God, the person, and that which he gives me for life and, for life and freedom. So I must love God, the truth and the truth giver. Then I must love truth as a means of life and freedom. That not only do I love God, who is the truth, I love the truth that he gives me because that is the, it, in that is my life and my freedom. But then, look at what it says next. I need to love myself. I need to love myself. Why? As to see the benefit of knowing and living by the truth. When I love myself and I love truth and I love the benefits of truth, what I'm recognizing is loving self enough to, to, to submit myself to the truth as to live by the truth because I see the benefits of that. And in so I'm loving myself. Now the great commandment says love God with everything you are and love your neighbor as you love yourself. In order for me to love my neighbor as God calls me to love, I need to love them like I love me. And if I'm to do that with truth, then I better love the truth too, and I better love myself enough to subject myself to the truth. Then do I love others according to the truth. And do I love them enough to speak it in love, by love, and out of love. It is not merely enough to know I must speak the truth in love. It is to recognize what that speaking looks like, what the truth is, and do I love, and who do I love. Am I keeping that in order? Am I doing what this passage is actually calling me to? So we go on. So speaking the truth in love necessitates first love. To be able to speak the truth in love, we must love God and the truth, the truth giver. Truth, the means of life and freedom. Self, as to see the benefit of knowing and living by the truth. And others, to love them enough to dignify them with the truth, by the truth. And this is in and for and by and out of love. Therefore, every conversation we, we have ought to be tempered by such a knowledge and a commitment to love. I'm going to stop here for a minute. Every conversation, not nearly everything we do, but every conversation we have should be governed by this truth, governed by this commitment, governed by this knowledge, got, governed by this understanding. That when we have an opportunity to speak to one another, we would speak with such intent that we would speak with such care and consideration that that's the way we speak to one another. Stop. That's speaking the truth in love. Loving God, loving truth, loving self, loving others, and speaking it rightly in right manner and right tone. We're gonna talk about that in a second. We don't have time to waste. We don't. The conversation I have with my friend Mark today may be the, the very last conversation I ever have with him. And what taste do I want in his mouth when he walks away? I've, I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago. I've come to this, this realization in, the, in my station of life that whenever I, my wife leaves the room, I give her a kiss and I tell her, don't ever leave without kissing me because I may never see you again. That's what I want to remember. Am I making sense? So we go on. Speech, now we're going to look at this in the context of the scriptures. You ready? Look at the notes. So speech is seasoned. If Colossians 4 says this. Let your speech always be gracious. There's the command. May your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer what? Each person. Now there are translations that says Everybody. But unfortunately, when we use the term everybody, we tend to homogenize that. We tend to go, okay, that's everybody. So, I'm, so speak the same way to everyone. You know what? No, you're not. Now, in regard to graciousness, absolutely. We speak graciously to everyone we speak to. But look what it goes on to say. It says we are to, be, we are to speak graciously, but it is to be seasoned with salt as to know how to speak to each, to what? To each person. Ah! Anybody here ever go out to breakfast with people? You go out to breakfast? 
All right, so love me, love me some breakfast, my absolute favorite meal of the day. You know what happens when you go out for breakfast? You all get your meal, and what happens? You all reach for the what? So, why? Well, because most of us will season our food. But you know what's really interesting is watching how people season their food. I've, I've eaten with people who, like, they take the salt shaker, and the first thing they do is they test it to make sure there's salt coming out. And how fast will it come out? Well, why is that? Because sometimes it just pours right out, and sometimes you have to shake it really hard. But either way, I want to know how quickly it's coming out. Some of them actually measure it according to that. And then they're like, well, like, they measure it, they do this, they go, and then they go. Now, in my world, I reach for the salt, and I use a little bit of salt. But you know what I use a lot of? Pepper. You know why? It ain't breakfast unless I walk away like somebody put a space heater in my throat. I want it to go whoosh like this. In fact, I like pepper so much that I take the top off and I, just, and I sprinkle it that way because pepper never comes out fast enough, ever. <laughs> now, there's something really important in this regard. When I watch people eat breakfast, what I recognize is almost never, almost no one eats breakfast like I do. No one seasons their food quite the same way I do. What I want to tell you is if you don't season your food like I do, you're wrong. You're wrong. And I don't care what you say your tastes are, you're wrong. Because really, you don't even know you've eaten breakfast unless your throat is on fire when you're done. So you've not eaten breakfast with me if you walk out and you didn't put anything on your eggs. Right? Or are we supposed to look at it like the verse says? That what we're to do is we're to season our speech. We're all to speak graciously to all people. That's the homogenated side. But then when, we, when it's time for us to begin to discern how it is we speak to the person in front of us, we season it. Listen to me. We season it according to their taste. We season the truth according to their taste. I'm not saying this. God just said it. And so when I'm in a conversation, and I am certainly speaking graciously, as I get to know the person, and I watch the way their life is seasoned, I begin to season the truth according to their, listen, according to their need, not mine. Why might that be so? Well, listen, let's go back to the breakfast analogy. The fact of the matter is, is the person sitting in front of me, and I'm wondering why in the world are you not putting salt on your eggs, I find out actually it was just diagnosed with hypertension. And so what are they not allowed to put on their eggs? Salt. Well, you know what? There are times when I'm speaking the truth to somebody who has spiritual hypertension. Hold on. Hold on. Which means I have to be very careful how I season the truth for them. There are some people who need a little bit of spice in their truth. And so I'll put a little bit on there. And as I'm testing the waters, and I maybe give them a bite of my own spicy breakfast, I'll find out whether or not they can actually handle the spice. And I will regulate the, 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 that seasoning according to their what? Ability to eat it. That's the kind of care and consideration we need to have in conversation. That's the kind of care and consideration we need to have in the midst of conversation. That's the kind of kindness and care and consideration that we must be cognizant of. We must be careful when we're in the midst of a conversation in regard to truth. Now, don't get me wrong. The egg is the truth part. The egg doesn't change. We're all having the egg. But some of us like them over hard. I don't know who you people are. All right? Might as well just slap you with a piece of rubber, but all right. Some of us like them scrambled. Sorry, too hard to eat. You can never chase those last few crumbs around, right? For some of us, we eat them the right way. It's called over easy. Just enough yolk to be able to sop it up with some bread or a tortilla and some potato. Not so runny that yucky, snotty egg white is still there. And for those of you who eat that, you and I aren't eating together, okay? <laughs> But here's the deal. The truth is the egg. The seasoning is the manner with which we serve the truth. And that's the truth. And that's our privilege. And that's our honor. You know, I find very little greater joy than having my family or friends in at my house on a Saturday morning 
or a holiday morning and I get the privilege of making everybody's breakfast to their, to their specifications. And my greatest joy then is seasoning it just the way they like, with usually a little bit extra just to test their limits, right? Just to push the envelope just a little bit and then to be able to watch them enjoy it, right? Listen, so it should be with the truth. So it should be with the truth, especially among brothers and sisters, but even to a lost and dying world. The truth doesn't change. Don't lose sight of that for the rest of the way, the rest of this morning. But how we season it and how we serve it and how we communicate it has everything to do with the palate of the one to whom we speak. Has everything to do with the digestive system of the one to whom we speak. The spiritual health and condition of the one to whom we speak. And we should be that considerate at every mealtime. Every time. Whether it's a snack or a seven course meal. Does this make sense? Okay, so we're going to go on. So we, we want to season our speech. Go to the next sentence. It says, this is especially true when I am presenting something in writing. Now, this is really, really important. One of the things we need to recognize is how, how, how important words are and the impact words have. And that it is that very thing that, that the, the, this command in Colossians is calling us to be cognizant of as we present truth. What words are we choosing? What tone are we choosing? What, what manner? What reason? What purpose? What intent? This is especially, though, especially true when presenting something in writing for all to see, something that lasts for posterity. But why? First, I need to be honoring God, and second, I need to realize because of who and whose I am. Not just honoring God, but honoring who I am and to him. We are, I am, held accountable. This is something we need to understand. We are held accountable for every idle or careless word that I speak. In other words, I will be held accountable for what I say, how I say it, and to whom. And the more people that see and hear what I say, the greater responsibility and accountability at that judgment. So what is it saying? This is in Matthew, and Jesus is saying, listen, you will be held accountable. When judgment comes and we're standing before our God, one of the things he's going to weigh is our words. And he's going to say, you're going to be held accountable for every careless word you speak. Now, what is a careless word? A careless word is one that tumbles out of our mouths and hits something without our, without our taking into consideration what that word was, what, what it was going to do, and who it hit. And therefore, it's careless in regard to how it affects the person to, you know, that it hits. This is what I want us to understand. Are any of you guys like me, and you catch their, their words that are beginning to form on your mouth, and you know they're forming on your mouth, and you, knew that, you know that you should not let them get out from between your teeth. You know you shouldn't, and so you're holding on as tight as you can, and all of a sudden, blah, blah, and the words just come flying out. And it's one of those moments where not only does the word come out, but you can actually see it tumble through the air. Anybody? I can see whole sentences just tumbling. And I'm like, no! And you reach out and you try to grab the word before it hits its target, but you know what you can never do? Get it. And all of a sudden you're watching that word. It's like a piece of spit that you're talking. You know it's hitting somebody and there's no getting it back. And then you finally just see him go, oh, psh, I'll walk. Listen. There are moments when words come out from between my teeth and out of my lips that I wish never came out, and as they tumble through the air, I realize they're going to hit somebody. And as I'm watching and wishing that I could somehow grab it and pull it back, it strikes them. This is what I want us to understand. There's no getting those words back. None. That once that word is out and has tumbled forward and has struck the heart the ears, the mind, the heart of the one to whom you are speaking, it leaves a dent. And no matter how hard we apologize, no matter how sincere their forgiveness, that word can never come back. Those words make indelible marks. This is why James says if anybody can hold their tongue perfectly, they, they are a perfect man. Re recognize, let me, let me put a little bit of a pressure reliever here in this regard. None of us will be perfect with this. But you know what we should be? Intentional. You know what we should be? Considerate. You know what we should be? Conscious of what we say and, and what it's doing to the recipient. We must weigh our words carefully. And listen to me, we're in a culture that doesn't. And generally speaking, if I may, we are a people who don't. 
we don't. And that's what we need to speak to today. How far we get, we'll find out, but that's what we're speaking to today. So, huh. so that sentence again, we are held accountable for every, I, now what's a careless word? I wanna make sure we understand that. That careless word, like I just said, are words that we're not taking into consideration, we're not thinking about it, we're not, we're not uh, we don't, we can't, we're not trying to comprehend what, what that impact is going to make. That doesn't mean we shouldn't say things that are difficult, we ought to. The fact, but to say it with consideration and care and knowing that it will make a mark. Now, this is, let me tell you something that seems careless that isn't, okay? Let's say I got a buddy of mine and he's really down in the dumps and for whatever reason I just can't seem to cheer him up. And so in the middle of all that, I just tell, I just tell Mark a goofy joke. Just a silly joke. Nothing, nothing, nothing particularly inane and neither, or profane, nothing particularly profound. I just want to make the guy laugh. Do you know what that isn't? Idle talk. I care deeply for him, and I'm intentionally trying to bring some levity and some merriness to his life. And so it has nothing to do with the profundity, how profound our words are. It has to do with what the intent of the word is, and whether we care for the recipient in such a way as to deliver it in a way that allows him to find, or her to find life and not death. Encouragement and not discouragement. Does that make sense? So I'm, this is not about being word police. That's not what I'm saying. It's about loving people enough to speak the truth in love. And sometimes the truth is, you, you, that's an awesome mustache you have. E -e, okay, and um, I'm glad you're playing Mario tonight. That's awesome, all right. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because this is not, listen, this is not about being the police. It's not. There's no way to police this kind of conversation other than tempering it with love and consideration. That's the only way to police it. That if Mark and I are having a conversation, that he and I choose our words according to the seasoning each one of us needs. And if, and, 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 and Mike, we're all about pepper. So if Ken and I are talking, again, so here we go. Ready? So we go on. That is why it says in the scriptures. Now this is, ready? This is, that's why it now it says in the scriptures, in, J, in James chapter three. It says that, that not many should become, or the, another, a better translation of this is to presume, okay? Um, not many of you should presume or become teachers, as those who teach will be what? Judged more, what? Strictly. Now you might be asking yourself, why in the world are you putting that right here? Because frankly, most of us in this room don't consider ourselves teachers. In fact, we purposely are not a teacher, and we're listening to you who is a teacher. So I'm not sure why you have this here. Well, let's read on. That's why it says in the scriptures that not many of you should presume to be or become teachers, as those who teach will be judged more strictly. There's my note. What are we doing when we unilaterally place something out there to be seen, heard, and read? Teachers. Why? We are making our claim, staking our claim, exclaiming our thoughts, positions, and opinions on a subject with an eye to instruct or convince anyone who would hear or see it. And this too often without any real opportunity for thorough dialogue, the kind of dialogue, uh, the kind of give and take of two people expressing a desire to grow and mature. So oftentimes we throw something out there unilaterally without really thinking about the fact that nobody's gonna get to retort. Now, let me talk about this teacher thing for a minute. I'm assuming that if you come here, especially if you come here regularly, you trust that me or Brad or Aaron have prepared all week for you. That we pray and we study and we take into consideration. We look at the history, we look at the culture, we look at who you are. We, we very carefully take into consideration what it is we're gonna say, how it is we're gonna say it, and we make sure that every word that we use is chosen very carefully for your sake. I trust that you trust that. That's what a teacher does. And here's what I have to understand as a teacher. Although I love doing it, I, under, I also stand to re, understand the responsibility of it. That, there is, that, that I'm not talking to the air and neither am I talking to just one person. The reason he says don't presume you're a teacher because you'll be judged more strictly is because the strict judgment comes due to the exponential nature of what it is I have to say. See, if it's just me and Mike talking, then it's just between the two of us. If a couple of people happen to be listening, certainly there are a couple that are going to be affected. But when we teach and we're talking to hundreds, and some people thousands and tens of, tens of thousands, what we say is going out exponentially. 
And I will be held accountable for how those words land on, listen, on each one of you. And then not only you, but who you would repeat what I say to. So that when I stand before God as a shepherd, he will look at me and say, Anthony Michael, today we're going to weigh your words. Today. Today we're going to see what words you threw out there and what ones were with care and what ones were careless. That's pretty weighty. Well, here's my opinion. Any of us who takes the position of putting something out publicly without any possibility of there being a direct dialogue where our thoughts are being tested and we've proven our preparation and we've proven our prayerfulness and we've proven our consideration and we've proven our care and we've proven that we have extrapolated all bad ideas out to boil it down to one thought and we put that out publicly, you know what we've become? A teacher. And you know what's going to happen? Those words will be held accountable. Does that make sense? (laughs) This is a big deal. This is a really big deal. And listen, it's a a really big deal for believers. You know why? Because we're all leaders and we're all teachers. Even if we only teach one. Where are we leading? Well, who are we following? We're following someone to the kingdom and we're asking people to go with us and we're asking them to watch our lives and to listen to our words as to guide them to the king. Every tone, every manner, every word chosen very carefully to do what? To steer people either toward or away from the kingdom. We need to take responsibility for the words we say and in particular, the words we write. Anything that we place out in public for people to see and consume and have them impact them, potentially for an eternity. And we have no excuse. We know the rules. Am I making sense? So we're going to read on. Okay. Here are the questions we have to ask ourselves whenever we speak, but in particular whenever we write. What is my intent? Is it my intent to instruct, encourage, build up, edify, to speak truth and love? Is it my intent to invite discourse in a way that allows each side to be encouraged and dignified? Am I protecting the name and reputation of others? Do I know the truth, the whole truth, before I lay claim to it and declare it for everyone to hear and see? Or am I just trying to get my point across to make my opinion known or to win? Those are questions we need to ask ourselves anytime we're going to speak, anytime we're going to place something out into public. And do we, have we approached each statement with this kind of brevity? Love, concern, care, and consideration for others as well as being held responsible and accountable by God that with God's name and glory and the wor- our words affect in mind. If not, then we are not acting in wisdom, and if we are not acting in wisdom, we cannot be acting in love, at least not love for God and others. Prudence and wisdom stride hand in hand. Love envelops these and is most effectively expressed for all parties involved, wisely and prudently, always looking carefully to love according to the needs of the one loved. Words. The power of words, the responsibility we have with words, anytime we put words out. Now, what do we do with this? In the confines of the body, we are called to something that is more difficult than we presume. A lot of times we take for granted the quality of the music that we have at Mosaic in terms of the musicianship, the writing, the theology, the doctrine, the teaching, all the wonderful things that occur. But in particular, one of the things we can take for granted very quickly is how beautifully they sing. And whether or not, I don't know if you were listening, but this morning you heard three-part harmony that was absolutely beautiful. As Matt was singing the melody, you heard two of the women weaving back and forth around the melody with what we call harmony. And that evokes something. In fact, I can't wait to get to heaven because I can't imagine what it's going to be like to sing in that choir. That there are angels going to be stationed all around the throne and, and we're going to be blasted by this incredible sound. And then we get to join with them in praises to God. And we do so as if the... the, the oh, And if you've never experienced music as a musician, 
let me let, 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 me let you in on something. Uh, look at your notes, and what, for the sake of time, because there's a lot to do today, for the sake of time, I've put the verses, the, the parts of the verse that I want you to see in the margin in, in, your, in your bulletin, listen, or in your notes, everything there, listen, please go home this week and tear this thing up. Especially if you can get the electronic notes. There are more verses there. You can eat off this thing for about three weeks. Please go do it. But this is what I want us to see. Romans 12, 16 says something. Now again, we're supposed to speak the truth in love. We're supposed to speak truthfully to one another. We're supposed to do so lovingly. And it's the idea of reminding us who we are in Christ Jesus and then, and then pushing that out. But we also need to understand that we bring colossal differences into this room. The reason we're told to do this in love is because it's hard to do. And it's really hard to do because as we look at the truth, each one of us is going to look at the truth a little bit differently. Let me go back to the egg analogy. The, egg, the truth is the egg, and everybody eats an egg, but we'll all season it a little differently. We'll all view it a little bit differently. We all may even cook it a little differently. It's still the truth. It's still an egg. But we're going to, it, 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 in terms of how it affects our palate, it's going to be a little different for each one of us. Not the truth in the substance of the truth. It never changes. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. But how we perceive him and from what angle we see him is a little bit different. And I want us to see that biblically. And, and, it, and it really has, it's what it is, it's inferred by this command. Look what it says. It says, live in what? What's the word? Live in what? Harmony. Okay, so here's the deal. I had an individual come to me after the second service and say to me, listen, Tony, you know what a really great part of this analogy is that it's actually very difficult to sing in unison. The reason it's hard to sing in unison is because it's absolutely essential that everyone's pitch perfect and within the tone and the rhythm and the, and the, uh, of the song. But this is what I want to understand. We're not called to sing the melody yet. What we're called to do is sing a harmony. And so we need to recognize what the melody is. And in our particular case, Jesus sings the melody. And we can all certainly sing in unison with Jesus. And so as Jesus sings the melody of the truth that his Father is God, we can sing in unison with him that the Father is God. But we begin to harmonize when we begin to view the Father a little differently based on how we've been made and what our experiences on earth have been with fathers. And so we need to have it seasoned just slightly different as each one of us comes from our station of life and our particular bent as to how we see the truth of the Father, how we hear the melody and sing in harmony to it. And let me talk about harmony for a minute. My wife and I actually met in college in the choir and in the band, in the jazz band in college. That's how we met. That's where we met. I love to sing. The, 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 the wonder of singing isn't in singing a solo in my world. In my world, it's singing a harmony. In my world, it's singing in close proximity to another musician. But I want us to see what that takes. So look at your notes again. We're going to look at this idea of harmony and what harmony actually is. Harmony doesn't just come, okay? Now, there are people who are good at harmonizing. They hear the melody, and they can begin to, to sing by ear to the, to the melody, and they're, they're pretty close to the harmony. But that's not singing in harmony. It's singing a harmony. But we're called to sing in harmony, and that's a little different. So we're to sing in harmony with one another. So what does, it need, what does it take to be able to do this? Well, as a musician, you need to know the key the song is being sung in. You need to know the melody of the song. You need to know the chord structures within the key that lead the melody along. You need to know the rhythm for which, and by which it's been written, the tempo to which you're to sing it, and then the tonality with which you approach it. All of those is just the beginning of the knowledge of the song before you ever even begin to sing. And each singer then learns the song according to that. And you know why? Because you're going to learn it differently. You're going to hear it differently. It's going to strike your taste a little bit differently. And you're going to apply your musicianship and artistry a little differently. So here's the deal. I used to lead worship. I love leading worship. But I had a lot of difficulty leading worship. I'm not as nearly as gifted as Matt, number one. And number two, when I, when I would practice worship, I would do it by myself. Because my favorite thing to do is to grab my guitar, go into my closet, and play some songs. And I just sing it according. I'm singing to Jesus. And so those songs I sing according to my bent. And so there are areas of the song I slow down because I want to contemplate. And areas of the song I might, I might sing, I might be more dynamic because I'm praising him. Or I may speed up because I want to move along. So when I would come into a group and, and try to sing, it would be almost impossible for, me, for you to follow me because I knew the song as I knew the song. Well, that's true for all of us. And so what has to happen is each one of us has to practice the song we need to know the song and then when we bring it together you know what almost none of us sing it the same way and so now we have to sing it together in the melody to learn the song according to how it was written and how we interpret it and how we do that together it's a ton of work but not only that once we've begun to do that then there are other things we bring to the table look at the list again 
Then we bring our own particular gifts, skills, voice, qualities, vibrato, range, tastes, and influences. And we bring all those to bear. Then, together, bringing their conflicting knowledge, their conflicting taste and skill to bear on and with one another, not until two people have worked through the differences of their approach to the same song can they begin to sing together, but that they may not yet be able to harmonize to bring all their differing and conflicting tools together to, into complement. Until they do what? Until they practice, alone and together, and usually bring somebody else in to help them hear what they can't hear. Oh. And so we have the body of Christ. The fact of the matter is, is although we have truth, and truth is truth and it never changes, how each one of us perceives the truth is going to be a little bit different. And that usually is according to the bent, how God has made us. Now, you might be saying, how in the world can that be? Do me a favor. Scroll down your notes. I'll scroll. You do whatever you need to do. And what I need you to do is I need you to go to, well, first of all, Listen to this from 2 Corinthians. This is work. Harmony, we, th- we, we see the command, harmonize with one another. We think, okay, well, that's, it just should be. You're the church. You should be harmonizing. Uh, listen to 2 Corinthians 3.11. It says, finally, brothers, rejoice and do what? Aim to harmony. You know why? You know why to aim for it? Aim for perfect harmony. You know why? Because it's a goal. Stop. Mm-mm. It's a goal. It is something to be worked on and practiced. It is something we work toward, and we have to do that together. If we don't do it together, there is no harmony. There have to be differing notes and differing interpretations of the song that we all bring together and we move forward. Now, this is really important because each one of us is going to approach this differently because we come from different places and we've been made in different ways. To look, go down your notes and look for Proverbs 18. It should be 1817, by the way. I, have a, I left the one out by mistake. Proverbs 1817. Is that what I wanted? Oh, I skipped something. I want to make sure. Oh, I want to make sure we do something first. Go back up in your notes. Why do we think, okay, so here's the deal. We have truth standing in the middle. We're called to harmony. The reason we're called to harmony is because each one of us brings something different. And we bring it in from a different angle. And so what, what does that spark? What's it spark? Conflict. We're going to conflict over the truth as we view it. We're going to conflict over the truth as we view it because we bring different perspectives in. But this is one of the things I want us to understand. Why do we think that conflict only has to exist between two people? And if it exists between two people, that one person is automatically right and the other person is automatically wrong. So let's say, if I may, Rob, come here for one second. Let's say Rob and I are looking at the truth, and we're looking at the truth as, in the word, and we're each coming toward the truth from a different angle. And we don't necessarily agree on how we apply the truth. We see the truth as truth, but we look at it from a little different angle. Does that make him wrong and me right? Or could we both be right, but we're looking at it from, from conflicting angles that need to be brought into complement? Why is it every time we hear conflict, we think one person has to be wrong and unrighteous and the other person has to be right and righteous? When in fact, we could be looking at the exact same truth, believing the same truth, wholeheartedly wanting to deliver that same truth, but we're going to deliver it with a little different seasoning. We're going to cook that truth a little differently. And it's going to be based on how God has made us. And what makes us think that a conflict is between two people? Have you ever had a conflict in your own head? Have you ever had thought about something until you think it's true? And so you just put it out there because you assume it's true and then somebody pulls you to the side and said, did you really think that? Do you really think that's right? And all of a sudden it's being tested by somebody else and you realize, oh shoot, I should have been listening to, you ever do that? So when we see conflict, we need to first and foremost not assume that everybody in the room is wrong, but that each one of us is seeing it from a different angle. And it's really important for us to recognize that. Why is that? Now go to Proverbs eighteen seventeen. It says, in a lawsuit, the first to speak seems what? Seems right. Until when? Until someone comes over and cross-examines. That we have thoughts that seem right. 
And they seem perfectly right. You know why? Because nobody's, nobody's actually challenged it or tested it to see if it's true. So there's two things we do with our own thoughts. First of all, once we capture it, we compare it to the truth. And that's the first test to tell us whether or not our, 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 that our thought might be correct. The second thing is we bring a brother or a sister aboard and we go, okay, let's test this truth with one another. Because the thought in my head seems right until I do what? I put it out there. And all of a sudden it's like, Psh, I find out, oh my goodness, other people have other opinions on this. I never imagined but we say it with what? Authority, because we think we're what? Right. And so it is with, between the two of us. Somebody might present something, and another person comes next to us and go, really, is that what you really think about that? Now that's well and good if we do that privately. But what we've learned to do is do this publicly. And we'll present a truth out there as if it's truth, never having been tested, and then wonder why people jump all over it. We have to be really careful with our words. We have to be really careful with our words. So let's go on. You know, I'm pretty convinced that when Jesus was talking about discipleship and how everybody would know we were his, this is what he said. He said, you know, they are going to know you're my disciples by how you trash each other publicly. Oh, stop. Wait, is that what it says? No, he said, they're going to know you're my disciples by how you love one another but we're better known for how we trash each other than how we love each other. And they're, we're better known for that because we put things out there without having thought it through according to the truth and seasoned. And then arguing about it publicly. Then actually taking into consideration what we're saying and what the impact is going to be and maybe even not putting it out there at all. So we go on. Now, I want to go to this bent idea. Go to Romans 6 with me. It says, we have different, now you'll see at the bottom of your notes, you'll, and I put the blurb there. Well, Proverbs 22, 6 says this. It says, train up a child in the way they should go. I want to go back to this idea that we see the truth differently according to our bent. It says, train up a child in the way they should go, and even in the end, they shall not depart from it. Now, this is what I want us to understand. That phrase, the way they should go, is twofold. There are two distinct meanings in, that, in the phrase, and both matter. The first is the way they go, the first is more general and all-encompassing. Raise them up in righteousness according to God and move them forward and the end they will not depart to it. That's the first, and that's for all of us. We're all to train our children in righteousness and holiness and to love God. That's for everybody. But then the second command, the second part of the command is this. Do that according to their bent. In other words, know who they are and raise them up according to their bent and in the end they will not return. In other words, season it for their sake. So let me give you a good example. Let's talk about truth for a minute. Truth is that Jesus loves broken people. I believe that's the truth. Brokenness can be manifest in a lot of different ways. I think that's the truth. I think how we respond to that brokenness is, is determined by both the circumstance and the person who's broken. And that's the truth. And if we do that lovingly, meeting the person where they are, we try to season the truth according to their palate as to lead them to the place they need to go. And that can range from what appears to be pretty harsh to, appear to things that can be very, very gentle. In my house, now, I have four children who I like most of, okay? They are nothing alike. And so the first time we held each one of our children, we could see from the time they were born how different each one was. And I'm going to pick two of them out. I'm not going to name them. I have one daughter who is probably the most benevolent, gracious, hospitable human being you'll ever meet in your entire life. This girl does not say a word without thinking about its impact. She's, she actually changed her career field because she so desperately needed to express her gifts of mercy and care as a nurse. So she went from art school to nursing because she had to express those things. She's that benevolent, she's that kind, she's that gracious. She's a stinking, liberal, California hippie. Now, before you judge me, if I may, I have a son who's all about justice. He has served in the army. He has served tours in Afghanistan. He is going to become a police officer. If you broke the law, you deserve whatever you get, and I'll make sure you get it. He's about justice, and he's about making sure that he's keeping people safe from people who aren't safe. Huh. Have Thanksgiving dinner with those two.
You want to hear some irony? She's the most difficult person in my family for me to get along with. (laughs) She and I will argue about everything, and she and I will not see eye to eye on anything, and yet her heart is more like mine in terms of compassion and empathy and grace. He and I can do anything together and get along just perfectly fine, even though we don't necessarily see eye to eye on the harshness of his necessity for justice. You know what's really neat when the three of us are sitting at a table? Jesus sits right in the middle and all of us draw each other into him. That my son draws my daughter and her mercy into the need for justice. My daughter and her mercy draws my son into the need for grace. And they both teach me how to be like Jesus. And do you know that's what it is to live in harmony? Do you know that that's what it is to see the truth a little bit differently in the confines of the church and to know that we need to aim for perfect harmony? Because each one of us comes in with a bent that's just a little bit different than the rest of us, and it's on purpose because none of us can represent Jesus perfectly. He gives each one of us a tiny taste of an attribute of him that draws us each to the center where Jesus stands in the middle. And we have one person who says justice must be had, and, and I realize it, but you know what? There's accountability and responsibility. Another one says mercy must be had, and therefore we must bring in and we must say, have and we must nurture, but the two must work together in order to accomplish God's kingdom stuff. And we must, must choose carefully our words when we are unwilling to examine the possibilities that we're both right. And that when we do so, we do so in a way that, that, that cares deeply for the, for the the Jesus the other one brings and how we might be formed and shaped in, shaped in that likeness and how we can begin to function as a body moving, aiming toward harmony. And if we don't choose our words carefully, if we don't take into consideration our biases, if we don't understand that each one of us is made differently for the sake of God, and the sake of God being seen to a lost and dying world and how we take care of one another and we nurture one another and we sharpen one another and we push one another, then all we do is look like a group of people who could give a rat's behind about how other people perceive us and that what Jesus actually said was, they will not know your disciples, my disciples because you chew each other to bits. They will know you're my disciples because you love one another dearly. And you bring all your differences and you bring them into the middle and you work through those things and you temper one another and you push one another and you shape one another into the likeness of Christ. Does that make sense? We didn't get to anything I wanted to get to today. I mean, we did, but we didn't. Let me encourage us. Bless you. As as the band comes in and we go toward communion, let us take this into consideration. The Holy Spirit, we ask, would examine our hearts and minds to reveal to us any sin we're harboring, any attitudes that are poor, any relationships that are broken. And today, I would, I'm praying that what specifically happens as we pray is that the Lord reveals to us how we use our words and our tone, our bent and how we see truth. How do we season the truth for the palate of those around us? And are we careful and considerate and loving in regard to how we communicate that truth? Do we choose our words with such brevity and such care that we, 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 are, we are desperate to make sure that when they land, they land with encouragement and grace and instruction and proper correction and loving admonishment? Are we that careful with our words? Not only spoken, but especially, listen to me, especially written. Especially written. Especially Today. We have the opportunity to bring the kingdom forward in a way with our words that Jesus will hold accountable, but will also celebrate it with us as we learn to do so in love. Amen? We practice an open communion, which means if you have a relationship with God in Christ, we, we just invite you to come forward. The one requirement is the one I just talked about, that while we sing this song, the scriptures implore us to allow our hearts to be examined Let the Holy Spirit show us any area where maybe our lives are not reflecting the grace that um, God has called us to. And so I would ask us to do that, that while we sing, we pray that prayer. And when we're ready, when we feel as though we've dealt with what we need to deal with, we'd come forward and take the elements back to our seats and together we'll take them. So let's stand and sing.
Death by 
broken heart let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come near cause earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal so lay down your burdens and lay down your shame and all who are broken lift up your face Jesus, the Word of God. That we recognize the wonderful privilege we have with words. Yes, it's a responsibility, and yes, it's weighty, but it's also a privilege. It's a privilege for us to be able to speak into the lives of others, to speak encouragement and life and correction and truth. It's a privilege for us to be able to carefully consider what it is that I can say now that will bring love and comfort and mercy. It's a privilege. May we not take that privilege for granted. May we not buckle under the weight of the responsibility but realize that God has equipped us by his truth and his spirit and his very love for us and his very word for us in Jesus to do that very thing. And he used words with his disciples. He says he took a piece of bread and he said this. He said, this is my body and it's broken for you. Whenever you eat this, remember me. And then it says after the meal he took a cup. He said, this is, this is a new covenant. A new covenant made in my blood for your sake, shed for you. Whenever you drink this, remember me. This is after the meal. They sing a hymn. In other words, they harmonized. Let's go in song. Once and 
for all the Father's love. He is the light in the darkness. Took on flesh, took our place. The weight of the world on His shoulders. The weight of the world on His shoulders. Not that we would become the word police, no. But that our words would be chosen based on the needs of the people sitting in front of us and that we would recognize the privilege we have to bring life and encouragement and grace and even correction, but doing so according to your will, according to your truth, with great love and affection. So move in us this week and may we take, in just, may we be t- take such great care with the words we choose recognizing that they're not just our words, but they go out and they make an impact. And may we, Lord God, then temper them, not with fear, but with love and the recognition of the privilege to bring life. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week. See you next week.